This is that great quote I mentioned before from uh, Dale Carnegie, my, my hero. Uh, he said, when dealing with people, let us remember we are not dealing with creatures of logic. We're dealing with creatures of emotion. Okay. Uh, and why do I have this graphic here? W what is this? Well, that's an iceberg underwater. Okay. And I mentioned that because I want you to be cold as ice, not mean, but just kind of ice cold when it comes to emotions and business. Okay. I want you to be unemotional. And I found that some of the most successful people I've worked for, some billionaires even, I'm not going to say who, some of them have, you know, borderline Asperger's syndrome uh, and they were wonderful people to work for. You know, they were, they were, uh, and I mentioned that only because uh, they were just very unemotional. You know, when things went really, really well, there wasn't that much high-fiving in the office. And when things were blowing up, uh, like in uh, August of 2007, uh, when it was, it was an awful year for hedge funds, I remember that because the Goldman Alpha Fund and Renaissance, two big tech hedge funds, reversed their positions and mean reversion destroyed all of us that one month. We made it up later on in 2007 though and had a good year. <laughs> and, and I'll teach you what all that hedge fund stuff means in the course too. Uh, but, but I remember that because my boss at the time was very unemotional. I, I walked into his office um, and um, he doesn't have Asperger's syndrome, but I walked into his office, it's Carson Levitt, guy I worked for at, at Citadel and at Pequot, a brilliant man and one of my mentors who brought me from New York to here to the Bay Area. But I walked into his office in 2007 in August. Uh, and, and I said, dude, have you seen our book today? I mean, our portfolio, we were getting killed that day. And um, he, he said, <laughs> I'll never forget. He said, Chris, I got this wrapping paper uh, for, for, for Christmas on sale today. And he was, wrapping, he was wrapping presents for his kids in August of 2007. He didn't care. I, I loved it. I loved it. And he's one of the greatest investors in history. And, and Carson used to work for George Soros as well. And I have a lot of great George Soros uh, stories for you as well. Uh, and Car oh, one more story about Carson Levitt. Totally off script. Sorry, but I, I got to go there. So uh, Carson uh, Levitt, who again was my mentor, uh, he's the reason I'm in the Bay Area. Um, he joined Soros, uh, George Soros uh, hedge fund uh, in the summer of 1999. And Soros was down 15% that year. And Carson joined the summer. And he, by, by December 1st of 1999, he got the, the flagship Soros fund back to break even. And then he had a 40% month in December of 1999. And it's amazing. And I asked Carson, how'd you do it? Uh, and he said, well, Chris, I was walking down Fifth Avenue uh, and I kept seeing more and more people with these cell phone things. And so I asked myself, what's in these things? Uh, and it was a Qualcomm chip. Uh, and you can you can look at it, um, just do some sort of search online. Qualcomm, December of uh, 1999. It was Carson Levitt working for Soros. Very unemotional and very long-term focused. You know, he probably asked himself at the time, in five years, are people going to be using more cell phones or fewer cell phones? Of course, more. And the cell phone is the desktop of the future and the, and, and the future is now. And that's why this MBA degree program of mine, I'm setting it up so you can watch it on a cell phone as well. 60% of me is here and this is 40% here. So you got to be ice cold. Here's some examples. PayPal. So a lot of people don't realize that uh, Peter Thiel and Elon Musk were the kind of the, the co-CEOs of, uh, of PayPal at one point uh, and Max Levchin as well. And what happened was... Um, PayPal actually, there was, there was a, a, a disagreement on the board of governors uh, with what Elon Musk was trying to do. So what they were trying to do at the time, uh, and this was back in the late 2000s, maybe 2000 or so, or I think a year before 01 when, or 02 when, when eBay bought them. Uh, but what happened was Peter Thiel wanted the infrastructure of the entire company PayPal at the time to be based on Linux, which is more scalable and cheaper. And at that time, um, Elon Musk wanted to base the whole thing on Microsoft technologies. Uh, .NET is what they called them at the time, which people in hindsight called .NOT. Nerd joke, I'll stop, no more, I promise. Uh, and so the board didn't want to you know, bet the future of the company on, on technology that wasn't as cheap and as scalable as Linux. And so the board actually pushed Elon Musk out. He got Heisman from the company. And, and rather than being you know, really emotional and upset, what Elon Musk did was amazing. He left but he believed in the company, so he invested a ton more in the company after he was fired. And of course, he's incredibly successful because of that, I think. Um, and another thing is, just in the stock market in general, you, you gotta be really, really unemotional, really unemotional. And I lick my chops and I get excited when the market sells off because that's when I can buy America on sale or the whole world on sale, so to speak, when I'm buying stocks. 
I love buying stocks that are broken stocks and not broken companies. I don't like catching falling knives, chart-wise, whatever. Uh, of course, I'll teach you all about um, fundamental analysis, valuation, and technicals as well, technical analysis, and how to build your own portfolio from scratch. Even if all that stuff sounds foreign to you, uh, it doesn't make any sense, don't worry, it will. It will. And by the time you're done with my MBA degree program, you will know how to start a company. You will know how to sell better than anybody. You will know how to network better than anybody. You know, you will have the best resume ever. Uh, you'll have the best LinkedIn profile as well. You'll know how to raise money. You'll know how to manage your own money and so much more. And all eight of those things I just mentioned, by the time you graduate from other MBA schools, I don't care how good they are, you can't do that. That's right. Ask people that graduate from any business school, Oh, so you graduated, so you know how to start a business. They don't. Ask anybody that graduated from any business school. So do they teach you how to interview? No. Did they make your resume amazing? Did they personally work on your resume and LinkedIn profile like I will your teacher? No. Do you know how to manage your own money better? No, but I know how to, I know how to manage other people's money better. You mean you don't know how to what a mortgage is and how that works? That's true. When, when I graduated Columbia Business School, it's a great school and I'm, and I'm proud that I went there. I have a lot of friends there. Uh, but when I graduated uh, Columbia, um, you know, within a couple of years after I graduated, we all had the same problem. <laughs> all of us graduate, all of us graduates. We all called mom, called mom and dad and said, I'm thinking of buying a house or an apartment. How does a mortgage work? You're taught how to manage other people's money, but not your own. You're not taught how to sell either. I'm going to teach you all those skills and much, much more. And, and the pricing point of my, my, my degree program is ridiculously low compared to every other business school on the planet. I'm putting my reputation on the line because my name is on the line and I'm going to make you all business rock stars or your money back. And you can tell it's not about the money for me. Not about the money. I'm just doing this because I want to do it. Um, I'm probably not. I'm going to lose money on this actually. I don't care. I don't care. It's just something I want to do. All right. Uh, and then you just got to be unemotional, like like cats. And I'm, I'm a dog person. I'm, dogs are much much cooler. And <laughs> I'm looking at this now, and it, it kind of reminds me of my my kids. They play that uh, that Minecraft. Minecraft's back in now. Less so Fortnite, by the way. Uh, Ninja's playing more 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 Minecraft now. Uh, my kids, there are these pigs in Minecraft, and for some reason they 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 try to blow them up. It's bizarre or sheep or whatever it is. Anyway, a little off topic there. Bottom line is, dogs are better than cats. All right. All right, next up, what I want to talk about is I want to talk about frustration. And you're all going to be very, very frustrated, very frustrated in your careers. And that's a blessing in disguise. And I hope you're frustrated. And I say it with love my heart because that will force you to get outside your comfort zone and get a better job, um, you know, making more money, if that's important, whatever, which it is earlier on in a career. Or more importantly, start your own side hustle on the side while you work for somebody else. You know, some schmuck treating you poorly, fine. That lights your fire, okay? Uh, and so what you see right here is a microchip, okay? And I want to talk about the traitorous eight. And I'm going to give you a very brief history of Silicon Valley right now. So what happened was um, the United States government and Americans in general were brokenhearted in about, about the year 1960. They were brokenhearted because uh, the Soviets, which was their biggest competitor at the time, uh, the Soviets beat them to space with Sputnik. And Americans were brokenhearted. And so the Kennedy administration, Kennedy, great president, by the way, um, the Kennedy administration, because he created the Peace Corps, that's amazing. I love that guy because of that. But the Kennedy administration at the time, they thought, oh my goodness, we've got to beat the Russians to the moon. And so the Kennedy administration created NASA. And in order to get the first rocket on the moon, you had to actually have a hundred little microchips that look like this in the top of the rocket called the fuselage. And they couldn't do it at the time. And so the first venture capital investment was made, the first notable one uh, was made um, uh, in a company called um, Fairchild Semiconductor. Now, before I get there, I wanna talk about the Traders 8. The Traders 8 are my heroes. And these eight people I'm about to introduce you to, they worked for somebody that treated them really poorly. They were frustrated. And so it was like a cabal. They all left together that company, the traitorous eight. I love it. And they, somebody's got to make a movie about this. And they started their own company that changed the world. And they would never have done it if they, were, if they weren't treated poorly by somebody else. And those traitor eight are as follows. These people here, okay? 
these people left a company called um, uh, Shockley, I think was the name of it. God, I'm having a, the older I get, the better I was. I'm having a senior moment here. It'll remind me in a second. I think it was called Shockley. They worked for a guy named Shockley. Uh, and he treated them really poorly. And so these eight people left to start their own company. Okay. And here are just some of them. That's Eugene Kleiner right there from Kleiner Perkins. Isn't that cool? Uh, and, and over here, you have Gordon Moore, uh, who is uh, you know, one of the founders of, of Intel. It's incredible. And, and later on, of course, we're going to talk about Andy Grove as well. You know, Andy Grove, late great Andy Grove, um, he said only the paranoid survive. Uh, and he did the most brilliant marketing campaign in history. Uh, and that's a great book, by the way, written in 1995. Um, but what happened was there was a microchip that Intel had, and we're doing a case study on this, a, a microchip uh, that they created in 1995 that had uh, a flaw in it, right? It was the Pentium chip at the time. I am dating myself. And the flaw meant that if you did very complex calculations, then 0.00001% of the time, your number will be slightly off. And nobody knew about Intel at the time. Uh, and again, I, I bought the chip. And I'm going to show you what it looks like during the MBA degree part. But what Andy Grove did uh, was he was very transparent, very ethical. Transparency builds trust. And what he did was he went on CNBC and all the talk shows to apologize and to warn the whole world that has Intel chips that there's a small chance that there might be a floating point uh, calculation error and we will give you your money back and replace all of your chips immediately. And he owned up to it. And he actually took a, a, the biggest weakness in the history of Intel and turned it to his biggest strength. Why? Because not only did it develop a bond and a sense of trust with consumers, with his brands, but all of a sudden, millions of people around the world that never looked inside a computer and didn't know what a chip was or what Intel made, all of a sudden they're like, oh, that's the brain of my computer, that Intel chip. Oh, interesting. That's what that is. Okay, Intel inside. Interesting. And then they went on this massive marketing campaign. You remember the, the jingle, duh, 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 Intel inside? And every time you saw that commercial with, with uh, when Dell or HP or Acer uh, or Gateway at the time, all those companies, whenever you heard that jingle, Intel paid for 40% of that commercial. We're going to study the marketing campaign of the greats. We're going to study Apple's marketing campaign, advertising campaign as well. You're going to absolutely love it. Okay. Now, there was a lot of red tape uh, with the Traders 8 when they worked for William Shockley. That's his name at Shockley Labs. Um, and when they started their own company, Fairchild Semiconductor, which made that chip, which went into the fuselage of the rocket, which beat the Russians to the moon, apparently, by 1969. Um, I've got that song, Man in the Moon, by REM in my head now. But what happened was that that company, Fairchild, got too big and bureaucratic. And it happens with all great companies. They get really big. They can't grow anymore. And they become bureaucratic. And it's like a political entity. And the founders leave. And when founders leave a company, especially in tech, if they're not attached at all in any way, it's usually not the best investment. And so what happened was there was a lot of red tape. And the traders eight said, I'm... This company is just too big now. It's too bureaucratic. Um, you know, when we started it, we were like eight kids in a garage. And so what they did was a lot of people left Fairchild Semiconductor. And when they left, they actually left to start their own companies. And those companies basically are now the, the basis for what is Silicon Valley. And at the very bottom there, you'll see um, it says the word Fairchild. And above them are all the companies that came out of Fairchild. And we call them Fair Children. Okay. A trillion dollar startup, they call it. All those companies you see up there exist because of Fairchild Semiconductor and because of the people that left Fairchild to start companies. As I mentioned earlier, Gordon Moore left to start Intel. Um, you had the founder, one of the founders of Kleiner Perkins, Eugene Kleiner, uh, leave. Uh, uh, he was one of the traders as well. He left to start Kleiner per Perkins, one of the best VC companies in history. You know, NVIDIA came out of this as well. AMD, other great chip companies, as well as the hardware industry and around that, the software industry and around that encompassing that, the uh, ubiquitous global internet industry as well. All of them came out of Fairchild. Okay. Now I want to talk about you are right and everyone else is wrong. I have to say it again. You are right and the whole world is wrong. That's what you got to think when you start your company. Okay, you got to have that mindset as well. You know, there's going to be a lot of naysayers out there. Uh, a lot of people will try and take you down. Uh, 
You know, competition will badmouth you. Your friends might say you're taking on too much risk. Some people might be envious as well. You are right and the whole world is wrong. And there's a logo of a company there on the tail of the plane, which we'll talk about in a second. Okay. You are right. Everybody is wrong. Okay. Just remember that. Just remember that. Especially if you're going to be a disruptor. This is a famous quote from the chairman of IBM 1943. He said, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. Do you think that had anything to do with influencing Bill Gates at all? Or anybody that was an, an icon in the computer market, Michael Dell, etc.? No. IBM. IBM said that. IBM stands for industry's biggest mistake. Or I've been moved. Or itty bitty machines. Just kidding. It's a great company. All right. Oh, here's some more examples here. All right. Variety Magazine on rock and roll said, it'll be gone by June, right? 1955. And of course, a lot of these magazines said similar things about the Beatles in around 1961 or two or so. Another great quote is this from the New York Times. A rocket will never be able to leave the, the Earth's atmosphere. You got to ignore everybody. In fact, I want you to ignore a lot of media publications as well, especially when you're doing investment research on companies, which I'll teach you how to do, because I don't want you to be influenced by anybody. You know, when a CEO uh, or, or goes on a, uh, on, on a talk show to talk about their stock, their company, of course, they're going to say positive things. You know, CEOs are the best salespeople. That's how they made CEO. Same thing with entrepreneurs. Also, portfolio managers and money managers, when they go on these talk shows, of course, they're going to say positive things about their, their companies because they invest in them. They're not being unethical. They, they disclose it. But of course, they're going to get you to like the stocks more because they own them. I always want you to do your own research and I'm going to teach you how to be a rock star stock analyst as well so that you can do your own research and not be influenced by anybody else. So you don't become a, a victim of group think like the walking dead or, or, or the, the hedge fund mafia as they used to call it in, in on, you know, on wall street and 90% of mutual funds and hedge funds underperform ETFs. And I'll get into all that finance stuff and how to build your own portfolio and teach you how to fish instead of giving you a fish. I'll never tell you what stocks to buy, but I'll teach you how to analyze companies. We'll discuss all that during this 300 plus hour MBA degree program which starts December 2nd. Okay, moving on. And I'm trying to teach this in a much more graphical way because it's more fun that way too. Uh, and uh, I, I've really gotten into to 3D modeling uh, recently too. And it, it's been a lot of fun. And, and during the MBA degree program, I'm going to teach you as many electives in the second half of the degree program, how to use many different products from Final Cut to Excel on steroids in a fun way too. Uh, also how to use uh, Photoshop, how to use just a ton of different applications as well as how I did this and much, much more. And how to use every type of camera out there as well, if you want to learn that as part of an elective, because, you know, I, I think that you only get one chance to, to make a first impression when you're doing online video calls and you'll all be doing a lot of video calls in the future. And if it doesn't look good and this costs me next to nothing to set up, um, then, you know, your reputation might not be as good as you think it should be uh, and you'll never reach your full potential. So I'm going to teach you how to use every type of camera, every type, if you want. And again, that, that's part of elective. All right. I'm right and everyone is wrong. And I'm building up to that little icon there, that little logo you see on the uh, right there. Okay. And before I talk about this company, let's look at the logo and we're going to study branding a lot um, and creating your logo. Uh, and so you'll notice in between the letter E and the letter X, what do you see if you look closely in between? You see an arrow. Okay. It's forward thinking, an arrow. Isn't that brilliant? Brilliant marketing, subconscious too, subliminal. And that's why with my MBA, uh, with, with, with my logo, actually, let me, let me see if I can, let me show you my, my logo I got here on the side. I think I created a, another angle. Hold on a sec. Yeah, you can kind of see it on, on, on the wall over there by my, my fake tree. <laughs> um, I've got, uh, I got to look here, yeah. Um, the arrow, the green part in my branding uh, points up, points up. So um, that I, I was inspired by, uh, by, by Federal Express because of that. All right, back to the presentation here. Okay, and, and also I mentioned that on the airplane here, everybody is wrong and you're right because the dude, Fred Smith, I think his name is, that, that started Federal Express, he went to, I think, University of Chicago Business School. He did an MBA there. And his thesis, he did a, a business plan uh, on, on Federal Express and his teacher gave him a C. Imagine that. Imagine a teacher giving you a C on your business model in business school. 
Would you have the courage to say your teacher's wrong and you're right? I hope so. I hope so. Anyway, that's kind of inspiring. Really inspiring. All right. Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about um, before I open it up to, to Q&A with, um, w w w in, the, in the webcast, video and audio Q&A and typing Q&A and all this stuff. And by the way, in the MBA degree program, there's going to be a lot of time. I will pause for questions. Okay. I'll pause a lot for questions. And um, by the way, the this this weekly webcast, which starts at 8 a.m., um, starting uh, December 5th, I think. Yeah, the 5th. That's Thursday. This weekly call that you're all on. I'm still going to do every week forever because I've committed to it forever, but it's going to end at 11 a.m. It's only going to be three hours, okay? And the reason it's going to end at 11 a.m. is because at 11.15, I'm going to do MBA students only uh, Q&A. Um, I hope that's cool with everybody here. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is taking that walk. Um, you know, some of the most successful people in history, um, they're, they're well-rounded, they exercise, uh, and, and you're going to be able to schedule everything. You're going to be so much more productive during this MBA degree program. It, you're going to amaze yourself, your friends, everybody, but what you think of yourself is the only thing that matters. Um, but a lot of people that are successful, they exercise. You, you know that, that dude at work, and you're like, I don't get it. How does she do it or he do it? You know, they're in great shape. You know, they have a great social life great, you know, great family life. Um, you know, they're, 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 they're doing very well in the company. How is that possible? Because they exercise. Okay. And I'm not going to teach you how to exercise and all this stuff in this course. Uh, but, but I want to inspire you to understand that the greatest entrepreneurs in history exercised a lot of them. And a lot of them actually take that walk. They take a daily walk. Uh, and I schedule myself every, every day at one o'clock in, in, in my schedule as well. They take a walk. And Steve Jobs used to take a walk every day. And that's when you come up with your best ideas. Why? Because you're releasing endorphins. You know, it's, it's like a free version of Prozac. It's amazing. And if I didn't exercise, I'd be depressed. And I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be as, as, as well-rounded, whatever, than I am right now. So you got to take that walk. Because motion, as Tony Robbins says, motion creates emotion. Okay? So Steve Jobs used to do this. He used to do this every day. He'd do it by himself. That dog's adorable, I know. <laughs> he would do it by himself or sometimes he'd even go on a walk uh, with Walt Mossberg uh, when Walt was interviewing him uh, or wrote and, and he wrote that great book about Steve Jobs. Uh, and, and Steve Jobs used to also go on long walks with his buddy, the founder of uh, Oracle, uh, Larry Ellison, brilliant man. Uh, and uh, that, that's when he come up with great ideas. It, it really is. Uh, and the same thing with, with Bill Gates. You know, Bill Gates... Um, you know, I've met him a, a bunch of times. He rocks a lot when he's thinking. He doesn't do it as much now with, with the, the Melinda Gates Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Beautiful man. He's done great things for, for, uh, for the world. Thank you. Uh, but, but he used to rock a lot more. And you can actually see him. There, there's a, I remember when he was, um, there was antitrust um, uh, lawsuit was in effect with the DOJ back in 1999. When he was testifying, he was rocking back and forth as well. He does that a lot. Uh, and, and that helps him to really, really think. Again, motion creates uh, emotion. So uh, I'll wrap up this this sample class here. Again, this is just a sample, a very tiny sample of, uh, of what we're going to be doing in the MBA degree program. It's going to be much more interactive, and I will be stopping a lot more for, uh, for live Q&A over video, audio, or you can type Q&A as well. Thank you.